28 years ago this month, I was lying on my bed in a retreat centre in Guildford Diocese on my pre-ordination retreat. I wasn't quite having a crisis, but I was deeply anxious. I was asking the Lord, why? Why am I doing this? Have you got the right person? Is this just a big mistake I've made? I just don't feel up to this. And I was reading Paul's first letter to the Thessalonians, and I got to chapter 2 and verses 11 and 12, and they read like this. For you know that we dealt with each of you as a father deals with his own children, encouraging, comforting, and urging you to live lives worthy of God, who calls you into his kingdom and glory. It was an absolutely extraordinary moment for me. It was like I was hit by lightning. Honestly, my whole body was alive. My heart was thumping. And all I could think was, that's it. That's my calling. That is what God is doing here. Whatever my ministry is to about, I've got no idea whether I'll be able to do all the right things in the right ways. But what I do know is that God has called me to encourage, comfort, and urge his people to live lives worthy of God, who calls us into his kingdom and glory. And I can honestly say that for the last 28 years, whenever I've been terrified about what I'm doing and thinking I'm probably doing a rubbish job, I've just asked myself, is that what I'm doing? And I hope I've been able to do that. Now, the reason I say that is not to point attention to me, but to ask the question, if we were to ask Jesus, if he was stood here now and we asked him, Jesus, why did you do what you did? What was the defining Bible passage for you and your ministry? I can 100%, no doubt, guarantee I know what passage you'd say. He would say it's this passage in Isaiah 61. This was his aha, lightning bolt passage. This is a passage where he goes, that's who I am. That's what I'm called to. That's what will define my ministry until my dying and rising day. How do I know that? Because in Luke chapter 4, some of you will be well ahead of me by this point. As he returns from being tested in the wilderness and begins his public ministry, he wanders into a synagogue in Nazareth and someone hands him the scroll from the book of Isaiah. And he, well, I, I said here he flicks through, but probably you don't flick through with a skull, scroll. And he gets to Isaiah 61. And unrolling it, he found the place where it's written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners, recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour. And then in the most dramatic way, he hands back the scroll, sits down and utters these words, Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. What Isaiah promised hundreds of years ago, that is now me. That is my ministry. I am that anointed one. I am the one who is going to make that become a reality. You all know, don't you, by now, you're all experts on Isaiah. Living in Jerusalem, speaking to the leaders of Jerusalem and Judah, and bringing a serious warning. He's told the corrupt leaders that their rebellion against God would bring God's judgment if they didn't change course. It becomes pretty clear that that's not going to happen. And God is going to use the great empires of Babylon and then Assyria to judge the people if they persisted in their idolatry and their oppression of the poor. And it's pretty uncompromising. It's a pretty dire and terrifying warning. And I'm sure you've seen it, though, at some times, but for Isaiah, for all its gloom, offers some glimpses of light, some genuine possibilities of hope. And that hope very much becomes focused on a person, doesn't it? This person who keeps appearing and being spoken of, the Lord's servant, the Lord's anointed. That through this servant, did you do Isaiah 53? I bet you did. That suffering servant, the one who would be scorned and ill-treated and killed on a cross through him. This vision of a restored world where the land again is full of abundance and full of right relationships between people and between people and God would become a reality. Indeed, the last lines of Isaiah 61 describe Israel as becoming like a new garden, just like Eden again. For as the soil makes the young plant come up and a garden causes seeds to grow, 
So the sovereign Lord will make righteousness and praise spring up before all nations. Do you get that feeling of what it is? This, this garden that's just been decimated. Suddenly, it's growing again. Suddenly, it's beautiful again. Suddenly, everything is blossoming again. That is the hope focused on the Lord's anointed, literally the Messiah. And Isaiah says that this Messiah, through this Messiah, God's going to bring about seven acts of new creation, seven acts of transformation for the people he loves. First, to bring good news to the oppressed. Then to bind up the broken hearted. And then to release the captives. Those who are bound up will find themselves set free, liberated from all that has a hold on them. I was listening to Radio 4 as I drove here, to a Desert Island Discs. Did anyone else listen to it as they were driving here? Clive Myrie was uh, this person who was put on... And he was talking about uh, when he first became a reporter for the BBC... And he said he got sent to Japan. And the thing he discovered in Japan was that in Japan, they had leper colonies. That is, they literally uh, locked up all those who had leprosy and kept them out of the way because it didn't fit with a Japanese ideal of purity and health. So what do you do? You lock them away. Which then just made me really struck by Tony, wherever you are, just talking there about Malawi. And here are children with disability today... And what does society do again? We lock them up and keep them hidden. We know that on the streets of Bath, probably in half the car washes we use, there are people who have been brought here as slaves. That across Bath there will be people who have been put on those boats in order to get here, who have been promised uh, money and prospects, yet find themselves under the power of slave traders and masters. We've seen in the past, haven't we, those who had to go and pick cockles. Why? Because they were under masters who made them go and do it, who lost their lives out in Morecambe Bay. We kind of imagine slavery and people being oppressed and people being bound up as somehow kind of from back then, and yet it is out there each and every day, we probably come across it more than we ever know. Why? Because we do as they did in Japan and they do in Malawi, is we hide it away. And we'll go on as if it doesn't really happen. But that happens in our worlds. That happens in our lives. Many are caught up in addiction. Just think how many people are caught up in addiction across this city. We don't see it. Or well, maybe some of you do to drugs, to alcohol, the horror and the mess of people's lives that we see across this city. But it's Bath and it looks Georgian and it looks lovely, doesn't it? But there's a reality that it's so easy to ignore. Well, here is the one who has come to set the oppressed free, to release the prisoners. And then right at the centre of these acts, we're told the Messiah will proclaim the year of the Lord's favour. Reference almost certainly to the ancient Israelite practice of the year of Jubilee. Jubilee meant, was meant to happen every seven years, where slaves would be released, prisoners would gain freedom, where all the debts that someone had built up over seven years would be cancelled. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Every seven years, your mortgage got paid off. Well, that's what went on back then. And, and there would be families who had land that had been given to them by their ancestors. It was family land, but they reached such difficult points. They were being oppressed. They were being exploited. They had to sell the land to get money. But after seven years, they'd be given back the land that was rightfully theirs. See, what Isaiah is pointed to is a day when finally there will be a cosmic jubilee, a renewed creation where all will experience freedom, where every debt is cancelled where every blessing is restored to God's people. No more suffering, no more pain, no more oppression, no more slavery. Hang on, though, you say. Why is this uh, year of uh, the Lord's favour, this wonderful jubilee, also called, as it says here, a day of vengeance? Well, I guess the reason is obvious, isn't it? If God is going to set everything right, that will involve dealing with injustice 
and reversing everything that's wrong. I think often Christians get a bit jumpy about God and judgments, as if somehow it's a scary thing and therefore a bad thing. We all know judgment is essential, isn't it? If we had uh, courts where, uh, you know, someone's committed a murder and they stand up before the judge and the judge at the end of the uh, court, uh, uh, you know, proceedings simply goes, oh, it doesn't really matter, off you go. What kind of a society would we live in? Our judgment is putting right that which is wrong. And yes, God will put right that which is wrong through the one that he's going to send. Those who benefit from oppression, those who benefit from unjust social arrangements and structures, the cosmic jubilee will feel to them a bit more like retribution than it will restoration. It all depends how you respond to the cosmic judge, the Messiah. If you repent and believe, well, then you'll experience freedom. If you refuse, well, then you'll experience it as vengeance. But what I notice is this, that it is a day of vengeance, but a year of the Lord's favour. In one sense, judgment compared to the favour is nothing. And actually, when is this year of the Lord's favour? When we've got to wait for it, is it 2026? Have we missed it? Was it 1803? It starts the day that the Lord's anointed comes. He said, today, this is fulfilled in your hearing. Day one, says Jesus, is Luke chapter four. And when does it end? My friends, it's never ended. It started and we live in the year of the Lord's favour. We live in the time where Jesus is still setting people free. Tony told us the story just this morning of how through an organisation, those young children are now being set free. Why? Because God is using. The power of Christ is still at work today, releasing children. And too often we think, oh, it's going to happen in a miraculous way. It doesn't. It often happens through me and you. Through the things that we do each and every day as we represent Christ. And I love it that it carries on, that as the, Isaiah continues, we see that those who are being oppressed, those who are enslaved, they're going to be, it's also those who are mourning, those who are in deep pain and grieving in this world will suddenly find that that mourning comes to an end. Then the last two acts he describes are how the Messiah will give new clothes to us. Not just clothes, but priestly garments. What he calls garments of praise. And then it says he'll anoint us with oil. Isn't that extraordinary? What the Messiah is saying is, I'm going to clothe you with the same clothes I wear. And I'm going to anoint you with the same oil that I've been anointed with that's made me Messiah. There's a lovely moment when it says uh, in Ephesians that we have already been seated with Christ in the heavenly realms. What is true of Jesus through faith in Jesus becomes true of us. When we put our trust in Jesus, we become pure as Jesus is. When we put our trust in Jesus, we are seated in the heavenly realms. When we put our Jesus, we are clothed in his priestly garments and we are anointed. In the book of Revelation, it tells us that in heaven there are 25 thrones. Did you know that? There's one big one which has got the Lord God sitting on it, but it says there are also 24 other thrones, which are the thrones of the elders. The 24 elders which represent the people of God through the ages. We are in the day of the Lord's favour because he has seated us already in the heavenly realms. We are free, free of the fear of death, free of the fear uh, that our sin will keep us uh, distant from God forever, free of guilt, free of all those things. Why? Because he's assured us that through faith in Jesus Christ, we are already seated in the heavenly realms. And I love this image uh, that just comes. It speaks uh, in verse 3 that they'll be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of Yahweh for a display of beauty. Now I know probably here it's, it's picturing the people of God like a beautiful garden. But this morning my daughter phoned me for Father's Day. She normally forgets but today she remembered. Eight o'clock. And uh, on my phone as I'm talking to her on speakerphone, 
there's a little picture that is the sort of little picture I put so when I know when it's Becca phoning me. And uh, it's a picture of Becca on her wedding day a year ago. The most beautiful picture of her dressed as a bride with the biggest smile on her face. Three years ago, she wasn't a Christian. I think I may have told you this. Three years ago, she was really struggling in life. But through COVID, through doing Bible study with my wife, can you believe, at a distance, she gave her life to Christ. She was going out with a non-Christian boyfriend, a big drinker. Uh, it was a, a diff different life. And now she's met a, a Christian guy. They're married, been married a year. And I just looked and saw the beauty of a bride. And it just reminded me of those words in Ephesians where it says that the church... Is like a beautiful bride without blemish prepared for her husband, the bridegroom. That you and I have been not just set free, but we have been declared beautiful. That you are beautiful. That All Saints Western is beautiful. Literally, spiritually speaking, people are wolf whistling us down the road. <laughs> Dare I say, well, maybe they ought to be. Because I guess this brings a challenge, doesn't it? If this is who we are, if we are God's free people, if we are living in the day of the Lord's favour, why does it so often look like we're not? Why do we so often act as if we're not? Then actually people don't find in us a people full of hope, full of joy, full of... Yes, now it doesn't mean that our lives are easy. The Bible never promises that. It doesn't say that the year of the Lord's favour means that everything in garden is rosy. It will be one day when Jesus returns. But it is a knowing that we are favoured by God. So I just ask you this week, as you go about your business, whatever it is, remember that you are a thing of beauty. That you are that which, through which people get a taste of this new garden, of this new era, of this new kingdom that he has planted. Do you know... Uh, some of you perhaps are not old enough to remember this, but I remember very much a picture of a young girl uh, in Vietnam who was, uh, where there had been a napalm attack and uh, she was completely naked, screaming. I bet that brings, for many of us, an image to our minds, doesn't it? I was, for uh, another reason, looking up to find out who she was, and uh, I discovered an article written by her in 2018. She's called Kim. She describes how her life was so affected by that childhood experience of war and that napalm attack, the physical pain and the burning that she felt for years, and worse, the hatred and bitterness that consumed her for what had been done to her. And she saw all sorts of ways to deal with the impact, and she never could. And yet her life turned around on Christmas Eve 1982. Having tried various religions, she found herself at a small church service in her hometown. She heard the news, the same news that was announced to Mary of a saviour being born, and Kim says this in the article, how desperately I needed peace, how ready I was for love and joy. I had so much hatred in my heart, so much bitterness. I wanted to let go of all my pain. I wanted to pursue life instead of holding fast to fantasies of death. I wanted this Jesus. And she goes on to say, when I woke up that Christmas morning, I experienced the kind of healing that can only come from God. I was finally at peace. That is the impact that Jesus Christ on, on had life. I was in a church just a few weeks ago in Bristol, uh, watching a number of people being baptised, and this lady telling us about, literally, she'd been on the trail through around the whole world, tried every religion possible, but eventually found Jesus, and it had transformed her life. My friends, this week, political parties are showing us their manifestos. Pages of promises of what they intend to do over the next five years, and every single one of them tells us they are our saviour. They will put right all that is wrong. That if you just trust them, everything will be so much better. I'm going to avoid making any party political comments at this stage. But I can't help but feel I've heard it before. Again and again and again. I'm not sure it's that much better, is it? Jesus declares his manifesto. The words of Psalm 61. These are my promises, he says. 
freedom, restoration, life in all its fullness. And I promise you that in me you will find them. So if it can be a bit cheesy, I simply ask myself, have you put your tick or the cross in that box that says Jesus Christ? If, if you've never generally given your life to Jesus, please can I urge you to do it. Talk to Tom. Talk to one of the other leaders here. Experience the freedom that he offers you.